So, are we good? Recording? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. All right. Oh, it's too bright. <laughs> so, my name is Craig Maloney. Uh, again, I'm one of the board members of MUG. And I'd like to talk to you about Mastodon, which is uh, in the larger federated universe. Otherwise known to my friends as that thing that I won't shut up about. <laughs> so what we'll cover is we'll talk about uh, so federated social media and how it all got started. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of social media. I'll introduce Mastodon to you. I'll talk a little bit about ActivityPub, which is the protocol uh, behind Mastodon and a lot of the other federated social media out there. And we'll talk about some of the other projects that use ActivityPub. So, in the beginning, there was nothing. And then, around 2006, 12 years ago, March 12th, 20, uh, 22nd, 21st, uh, there was a little tweet going on. That's when Twitter started. But around 20, 2007, at South by Southwest, the bird got a little bit bigger and became the social network that we all know today as Twitter. The thing about Twitter, though, um, I don't know if you've used Twitter recently, but it's kind of, there's a walled garden to it. There's no real way to communicate with anyone outside of Twitter. It's all locked in within in the Twitter walls. You only have one identity, or at least you're supposed to only have one identity on Twitter. Uh, I know a lot of people do have more than one identity on there, and there's a lot of clients that will support uh, more than one identity. But ideally, you're supposed to be one person on there. And it's a single point of fail well. So whenever Twitter goes down or whenever Twitter decides to ban your account for whatever reason, kick you off, or you decide, you know, you get harassed off of there for whatever reason, uh, there's nowhere else really to go. Uh, it's Twitter or nothing if you're on Twitter. So there's a lot of problems that really are, are part of the Twitter ecosystem. I can sit here and list off all of the problems that are currently happening with Twitter, uh, but that would pretty much take the entire meeting. Uh, and we have other things to worry about. You know, and, and it's become a bit of a, it's become a bit of a wasteland. I mean, it's, you know, there's, a lot of people are not really happy using Twitter. Uh, they just kind of do it because it's, you know, the way to contact people. But a lot of it is just people get broadcasted at, people uh, get harassed off of there. Um, it's just, it's kind of toxic in a way. So in 2008, uh, back in the long, long ago, when Twitter was initially getting started, there was a project, and some of you may know it, called Identica. Uh, Identica was started by Evan Pedromo, and in my mind, it was the first successful federated social network out there. Uh, there may have been other social networks that were federated, but this was really the first successful one. This is the one that got Robert Scoble on there. This is the one that uh, a lot of the tech journalists started uh, coalescing around. And it, cert it had about 8,000 registrations uh, and 19,000 updates within the first 24 hours of publicly launching, wow. which was impressive uh, when it launched in July tw tw uh, 2nd, 2008, and reached its one millionth notice on November 4th, 2008. That's impressive stuff there. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, as with all things, uh, people realized that Identica was not Twitter. And so slowly over time, they migrated back over to Twitter. And Identica, it had its very, um, it had its following. I know uh, the Twit network had its own status net server um, that it used. I think it was, um, I don't remember what exactly it was, like the Twit army uh, was what it was called. And so they had their own status net server. Um, uh, this Week in Tech? Like this Week in Twitter, Tech, Leo yeah. um at all, yeah. had, had um, their own version of that. Um, but over time, you know, the journalists migrated back over to Twitter. Everyone kind of migrated off of that. So time passes, and eventually, uh, Identica got relaunched with a new system called Pump.io, which was to try and make it a little more Facebook-ish. Um, the interface never really got to the point where it was a pleasure to use. It was just something that you kind of used. But the underlying protocol behind it uh, became part of ActivityPub. And the only reason I mention that is because that, that will come into play a little bit later on. Uh, the actual stat, status.net code that made up Identica. So Identica um, was released, um, there were two parts. There was Identica, the server, and then there was Laconica, the software. Laconica, the software, became status.net. 
uh, it got rebranded as status.net. So if you may have heard of status.net systems out there, status.net um, wasn't really being developed anymore, and so GNU Social merged that all together and, and created GNU Social, which is still out there. Um, it uses the OStatus protocol to communicate between each of these uh, systems. Unfortunately, uh, this is, I think, the only really positive article that I found about GNU Social. And this is in 2015, where a bunch of uh, Spanish folks got booted off of Twitter, or decided to leave Twitter. One of the, the people that they followed was booted off of Twitter. And so they all went over to uh, GNU Social. But again, it's not one of those huge, you know, you, you probably didn't hear about this on NPR. You probably didn't hear about it on the major, major news media or anything like that. It's very quiet. So again, time passes. And then in 2016, Macedon comes to the scene. And then it was launched in 2016. Uh, Macedon was developed by Eugen Roshko. Uh, and it was based off of his frustrations with app.net. And I don't know if any of you remember app.net. It was supposed to be a paid social network. Um, again, had one of those things where people were like, oh, we're really excited to get off of Twitter, and then it just kind of faded from view. And so he built this system. It's, uh, it's based off of Ruby. It's open source and that it's released under the AGPL license, the Afero GPL license. Um, and in 2017 is when it really hit, and it hit big. But of course, the journalists head over to there, and they're like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. It's not Twitter. <laughs> and this article uh, has a little bit of infamy. It was written by Lance Ulanoff, and it starts off, William Shatner couldn't find me on Mastodon. This was a problem. Now, for most of us, having William Shatner not find us would be a good thing, but apparently for, for Lance Ulanoff, this was basically the nail in the coffin for Macedon. And part of it is because social networks that are federated have a little bit of a discoverability problem. Um, and I'm not gonna read this whole article. Uh, you can find it yourself. But it, basically at Macedon, uh, April 5th is Lance Ulanoff Day, and we celebrate the fact that Lance Ulanoff uh, could not be found by William Shatner. So <laughs> naturally, you know, Mastodon is a failure, doomed, we're, you know, we'll all just go back over to Twitter and that'll be the end of it. The end. Any questions? <laughs> no. no. All right. No, there is still a little bit of life left in it. So what is Mastodon? Well, I have a video what here. What is Mastodon? Mastodon is an open source social network. Similar to Twitter or Tumblr, users can make profiles, post messages, images, or videos, and of course, follow other users. Messages follow a 500 character limit and are displayed in a chronological order. Unlike other platforms, however, Mastodon is decentralized, meaning that there is no one server, company, or person running it. While other social media platforms are owned and operated by a single corporation who has full control over everything, anyone can create and run their own server of Mastodon. How does this work? When someone creates their own version of Mastodon, this is called an instance. Since Mastodon is open source, anyone can create their own instance of Mastodon with their own set of rules. Because of this, all instances are owned, operated, and moderated by the community that creates them, and not some large corporation which tracks your data to sell to advertisers. <laughs> In most cases, Mastodon instances are crowdfunded, not financed. But how do these instances communicate with one another? While users within an instance can, of course, follow each other, they can also decide to follow users within other instances. So while each instance of Mastodon is privately operated, their users can still communicate with members from other servers seamlessly. Of course, communities who want to remain private don't have to communicate with other servers. This is in the hands of its users. Mastodon also offers effective anti-abuse tools to help moderate instances as users see fit. Ultimately, Mastodon is a social network which puts the user first. Unlike traditional social media, Mastodon can't go bankrupt, it can't be sold, and it can't be completely blocked by governments. Mm -hmm. Users are free to join whichever community they want and communicate with whomever they want. With over a million registered users across multiple different languages, Mastodon is growing fast. Not sure which instance to join? Click the link below to find one that's right for you.
Please don't click the link, otherwise my laptop will go bad. <laughs> so, as the video pointed out, Mastodon is a federated social network. And I keep using that word, federated social network. So what is federation? Federation is a whole bunch of different servers out there. The most famous federated social network, or federated network, is email. Every one of these email servers communicates via one protocol, which is SMTP. So they all can communicate regardless of what server you're running on the other end. They can all send their messages back and forth seamlessly. That's the same idea here. So each of these instances can communicate with all these other instances via ActivityPub, which is, again, the protocol that Mastodon uses. It also uses OStatus to communicate with GNU social uh, systems as well. And up until just recently, uh, Mastodon used OStatus, but now it's using activity, uh, activity pub. So the idea of an instance, an instance in some ways is kind of a club. It's basically one particular server, uh, an administrator sets up all the rules on that particular ser server, um, that it, administrator could be you if you decide to set one up. Um, and generally speaking, they have their own list of things, you know, Generally, they'll have like a code of conduct or something like that where folks you know, can say, okay, these are the things that, will, that are acceptable on here. These are the things that are not acceptable on here. You can also be on more than one instance. Mastodon does not care. Because it is federated, you can be multiple people on multiple systems, much in the same way that you can have a Gmail account and a Hotmail account and nobody's any of the wiser one way or the other. So you can be on multiple systems and have your own identity on all of those systems. So... In this case, let's say that my interests are that I want to do game development, uh, I'm interested in open source software, creative commons, blah, 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 and I'm also interested in role playing games, tabletop role playing games. So I can find instances for those things. And in the case of role playing games, I can go over to an instance like tabletop.social, uh, where I can hang out and talk about tabletop games, or I can go over to a game dev site um, that is gamedev.place uh, and talk about video game development or any type of game development on, on that system. And I can have completely different personalities, profiles, whatever you want to call it, on each of those systems. They don't necessarily have to tie back to one specific thing. The only thing is that they tie back to me in some fashion because I have the passwords. So you can follow folks on your own instance or you can follow folks on other instances. And I'll talk a little bit about how you follow folks uh, in a little bit. So again, I can be on my own instance and I can follow folks on other instances and get another instance. It doesn't matter. There's no limit to how many instances I can follow uh, with folks. So the interface on here, um, over on the left hand side, shows you these wonderful icons, which of course are very self-explanatory and not at all confusing. Uh, the first one is getting started, which is this little uh, star bit here. Uh, the local timeline, which is the instances timeline, <coughs> is over here. The federated timeline, which is the world uh, that that particular instance knows about, all well, those messages, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then preferences, uh, which will allow you to set all the preferences. So let's talk about the interface, and I will bring up here. So this is an instance called Toop Cafe. And over on this side, and I will make this bigger so that you can actually see it. I'll make it just a hair bigger than that. You'll see again that you have the getting started button here, the local timeline button, the federated time bu button, and the preferences button. And over here, this is the home timeline. This is all the people that I'm following on this particular instance. And that is all, and those are all the people that I'm following wherever they are. So that's all the people that are on other instances. Those are people that are on my instance. All the people that I follow go into the home timeline there. Under notifications, you'll notice that uh, some guy named James has followed me on this instance. Somehow he managed to find me. And then over here, you have a getting started section, which will show you the local timeline. The local timeline for this instance is all the stuff that's on this particular instance here. And I'll go into this a little bit more. Federated timeline is the 
a larger timeline out there, uh, the, fe the larger federation and such. And again, I'll talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll talk about lists. Uh, keep, I won't really talk about lists, but I'll talk about um, some of the other stuff here. And again, about mute, um, pin toots. You can pin a toot to your profile. Uh, mute users, block users, and again, preferences. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So, an anatomy of a username on here. So, on each of those instances, I have two sections. I had the username piece, and then I had the host name. This should look very much like an email address, in a sense. So the idea is that this is the account that's on uh, octodon.social, and I'm Craig Maloney at octodon.social, and this is the address that it goes to, octodon.social. Over here, uh, a different instance, this is my same name, Craig Maloney, I, I'm very creative in that way. Mm -hmm. And then it goes over to toot.cafe. Um, for those of you who are wondering why it's called toot, uh, Mastodon's toot. You know, they got their little trunks, they toot, whatever. And so <laughs> instead of calling it a tweet, they call it a toot. Polarity ensues. Um, <laughs> so the anatomy of a toot. Uh, if I wanted to direct my toot at someone, I can do uh, Craig, at Craig Maloney, and then I can put in the text after it. So this will be directed to the Craig Maloney account on that local instance. If I don't put anything after it, it will find that particular account on that instance and then send it to that particular person or address it. And in the same way, like Twitter will allow you to address someone. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to say, you know, at Craig Maloney, uh, whatever, it'll then show up in my notifications that someone sent it to me. If I wanted to send it to somewhere else, let's say I'm on Octodon and I wanted to send it over to, to, cafe, to myself at Two Cafe and give myself a notification about that, I can say, you know, Craig Maloney at Two Cafe, or sorry, at Craig Maloney at Two Cafe, Two dot Cafe, you know, is that Latin, blah, blah. I can also address multiple folks in this. So if I wanted to address myself over at Dice.camp, which is another uh, RPG related instance, and myself over at Two Cafe, I can do so. I can say, you know, at Craig Maloney at Dice.camp, blah, blah, blah. Apparently, I'm talking, like talking to myself in Latin. So that's sent to both of those instances, and that still allows me to um, get notifications for that. Where this comes into play is with uh, direct messages. You can have multiple people in a direct message. So if you wanted to do a group message with multiple folks, you can just put those um, addresses in there, and then all those folks will get that in their direct messages. So if you wanted to do a group chat on there, you are more than, more than free to do so. Craig, does that affect your 500 character limit? Yes, <coughs> it does. So let me compose a toot. So, at James. Hello. Hello. There. Are there any ideas of, just really quickly, are there any ideas of like distribution list or anything like that? No, no, there isn't. Like groups? Excuse. Groups? There's, um, no, there's no groups like that. You still have to type them all in. Thank you. That's been saved for posterity. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite in it? The show. You know what? Just for grins, since she's... Uh... Uh, it's going to act weird. Is it Waldo? Or is it James? Yeah, it's at yeah. There we go. So now I have composed a toot, and you'll see it shows that it doesn't necessarily show the, the full address of these folks in the toot in there, but you can see that it's, it's got both of them in there. And so they will both get notifications that I sent them the toot. Okay? Pretty straightforward. I can also attach an image to a toot. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> perils of doing live demos with, with social networks. <laughs> so I can show uh, attaching an image on here. So you'll notice down in the corner, you have the little camera icon that allows you to attach an image. So let me do a quick demo of that. Ooh. 
Dropbox. And since you have a giant mass of them. <laughs> So down in the corner here, I don't know if you see, you can put alternate text in there. And uh, folks encourage you to do this. Um, what that does is it allows other people who are visually impaired to be able to see the alt text of whatever it is oh, that you're okay. doing. Yeah. And you can also use it for descriptive purposes and whatnot. So let me toot out. You can crop it if you want. So if you wanted to just you know do the top piece of it, you can do that. I'm just going to do the whole image. And as soon as the network decides, there we go. Oof. So if I click on that, it will see it in Mastodon the same. Cool. Privacy controls. Now this is important. Um, there are several layers of privacy that you can use on Mastodon. Um, you can use public, which means that Anyone can look at the particular two, if you so desire. Uh, there's unlisted, um, and there is, let me go back here. Oh, come on, let me go back. <laughs> there we go. Followers only, and direct. And I'll explain what each of those does. So let's say that I'm on my instance. Uh, those folks on the top right corner, the, the Chaos of Witches, those are my followers. Over uh, that corner, we have uh, the home timeline. So let's say I'm over at Pepper's house. And then the federated timeline, which is Hareva. This is all from Pepper and Carrot, sorry. Um, so if I decide to do a public post, my followers will be able to see it. The people on my home timeline will be able to see it. And the people on the federated timeline will see it. It's basically public. Everyone can see that particular too. If I decide to do an unlisted post, though, what happens is it doesn't publish to the home timeline or the federated timeline. So those timelines won't be able to see it. But if they go to my profile, they will still be able to see that. It's just, it's more for like if you wanted to do a test or something along those lines, and you don't necessarily want to broadcast it out to the rest of the world, you can do that with an unlisted two. Your followers will see it though. It'll show up in their, in their timeline. So. That's, that's one way, again, to not necessarily pollute the timeline with stuff that you don't necessarily want everyone to see, or necessarily, you know, if, like I'll post a t uh, test post or something like that. And invariably, invariably, two people will say, I got it, and it's like, yeah, thank you. Thank you for letting me know that my test post got out there. You're very helpful, thank you. Um, it's the guy that says I didn't get it. Yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm more worried about the people who didn't get it, but. If I do followers only, then people in my home timeline and my federated timeline will not be able to see that. That will not, even if they go to my profile, they will not be able to see that. Only the people who are in my follower timeline will be able to see that particular post. So again, if I wanted just to go to my followers, and, the, and this gets into um, another level of privacy, which is where you can set it so that you can moderate who can follow you. So if you wanted to do a very private account and then have only a certain number of people be able to see those posts, you can then approve those followers and then send things followers only and they will be the only people that see it. Them and the administrators of the system, of course. Or I can do direct. So if I do direct, no one in my home timeline, my federated timeline, or my follower timeline should be able to see that particular post. The only one who should be able to see it are the people who are addressed in that particular post. Um, so in this case, it's like, I think we should go out for some coffee sometime. And again, if I wanted to send it to two people, I can send it this way. And the text is a little small, but it's basically at carrot at squirrels end at village and at pepper at chaos at witches, I think we should go out for some coffee sometime. That will then go to both of those folks and they will come and get coffee and that will be brilliant. How the administrator can't see those. The administrator can see those, but the administrator, it, again, it's one of those things where you have to trust whomever the administrator is. They're not encrypted. 
So if, if the administrator has access to the database or the admin panel or whatever, they can still see that. So there's still a trust level with your administrator, whomever, whichever instance you join, or if you create your own instance, of you need to trust your administrator in that instance. You could put encrypted text in there, though. You could put in encrypted text in there. Um, I'm not sure if that would be effective, but you possibly could do that. Yes? So is there any way to subdivide your, uh, your followers on uh, Google Plus? Um, there is a way to do lists, and I don't really cover lists in this talk, but the idea of a list, sort of like, um, I know if you're familiar with the client uh, tweet deck, uh, but the idea is that you can add individual folks that you follow into a list and then click on that particular list and then you'll only see their particular tweets or toots, sorry, toots in that list. So you don't necessarily get to drink, have to drink from your follower fire hose or whatever. You can subdivide them into different groups. And I've done that on one of my accounts. I have a whole bunch of different lists and whatnot. And I can sort of demo that, but I don't have it baked into the, the presentation. So let me talk are about followers or people who are following you or followers of people you followers that people that I am following. I can't subdivide people in it's not like Google plus circles, which is what I think you're thinking of where you can post to individual circles. It doesn't support that. Basically these are the only controls that you have. So you only have the ability to do followers only, um, unlisted, direct. Those are the only ones that you have or public. So, maybe in a future release, but at the moment it's not supported. Any other questions? All right. Let's talk about privacy here. So let's say I wanted to send a note to James. So you'll note here that the icon changes to a mail, um, like a little letter down here. So if I do Waldo, And if I wanted to do unlisted, I'm going to do that here. <laughs> awesome. Uh, all right, so this is an unlisted post. So if I go over to my local timeline, I'm not going to see that post and that particular listing there. If I do public, again, public posting, and then go back over to that timeline over there. This is again a public post, okay? Does that sort of explain what's going on here? I know it's a little, little tricksy. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, all right, let me delete this. So how does blocking work? Give it a second. Oh, okay. Give it a sec. All right. So Mastodon also has the concept of content warnings and sensitive media. Content warnings um, do not necessarily mean not safe for work. They're basically things that you want to put behind a little subject line so that people understand what the content of the tube is. Some things that you may want to consider. United States politics. Everyone wants to read about politics, don't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So what people will do is they'll use the abbreviation USPOL, and they're to say, I'm talking about United States politics. And they may fill it out a little bit more with like, you know, what they're, what they're yammering about. Um, MH is for mental health. A lot of people talk about their mental health stuff, and not everyone necessarily wants to read about someone's particular mental health stuff, especially if it's negative. And they'll put like a little parentheses and a minus sign on there, or a positive, you know. I'm having a great mental health day. I'm not having a great mental health day. Uh, religion is always the fun one. You know, politics and religion, those are the great conversation starters, aren't they? Um, tech culture as well. Um, some people don't really necessarily like uh, programmer tech culture and whatnot. So, you know, hide it away a little bit. And this one, uh, you have a lot of people who have had interesting and or otherwise experiences with Twitter or Facebook. Uh, so the abbreviation for that is Birdsight. Uh, for Twitter, 
and FB for Facebook and whatnot. Yes? Are, are these like Reddit, you know, people of Facebook that want to share what craziness is happening over there? Or I'm about to link you to something cool on Facebook? I'm about, I'm about to link you to something on Facebook. I'm about to make mention of Facebook. I'm about to do something related to the Book of Face. Uh, that's basically that, along yeah. those lines. So both make fun of people on Facebook and share something cool on Facebook. Or whatever, yeah. But basically, basically, you know, there's a lot of people who don't necessarily want to see Facebook-type posts in there. That's why they're on Mastodon. Uh, so let me do a quick demo of what that looks like. So if I hit CW here, it will say, OK, here's my warning. Um, I'll just put this as a test. This is a test post. Okay. So the way people can ignore it. And how that shows up, you see this little show more tag oh, yeah. here? So if I wanted to take a look at whatever it is, I can do so. Or if I have my whole timeline that's full of that stuff and whatnot, I don't necessarily have to read all of that stuff in there. This is really handy. Um, again, if you're just if you're having one of those days where you don't necessarily want to read about you know what exactly is going on in the United States politics, <clears throat> it's really nice that you know people kind of section that off a little bit. So it requires the poster to do that. It, and and there's a very heavy culture on Mastodon okay. for people to do that. Uh, people, people will get very upset with you if you don't put your stuff behind content. Marks. Most people that have an opinion on one of those things, they want everybody to see. I, yeah, and, and much in the same way, like farts in churches and whatnot, it's not terribly appreciated. Yeah. Uh, you can also, uh, let me post this here. So if I wanted to do this and I wanted to uh, put a content warning on it, what happens with this any media that you put with content warnings will automatically be folded underneath that. So if I do this, you'll see that it says sensitive content here. So it's put behind a little little barrier in that. If I wanted to click on it, then I can see, okay, that's you know that picture of a, of a mastodon in there. Um, you can also... If I wanted to attach that, and I didn't necessarily want to put the text behind it, um, if I wanted to do a little joke, I can click on this and it'll make that sensitive. And since that's sensitive, now it will um, and then you can, you know, you can have a little fun with it too. And if you don't necessarily want to see it, you know, somebody posts something, put it behind there, and it's like, oh, I'm really curious. And you click on it, and it's like, ah, yeah, <laughs> you, can, you can put it back there as well. So you have, again, some more control over your timeline. And how it looks. If you forget to do that, can you do it retroactively? Right now, you have to delete it and then repost it. Uh, there is a feature, though, coming in a future version. I think it's 2.4, maybe it's 2.5, where it's uh, delete and redraft. So it will delete the previous one and allow you to then redraft it. So it'll take the text and all the other stuff to it so that you can change it. Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily have to. Um, Re-edit it. And yes, a lot of people like, you know, for the longest time, people have been complaining on Twitter. I can't edit my, tu my tweets. Same way here. You can't edit this. Part of the reason for that is because uh, you can edit, if you have the ability to edit timelines, you also have the ability to change history. Mm -hmm. And if you change history, uh, you can make things really weird for people. Yeah. So, and also, yeah. uh, because it's federated and going out to all these different systems, they may not necessarily honor that, or they may not be available to honor that particular thing. So the idea is delete it first, and then in the, in the newer version, you can then it's all repost. repost it. Yeah. So is there like retweeting and There's boosting. So if you click here, you can boost a particular post, and that will go out to um, your various followers and go out to the timeline and whatnot. And you can do favorite. 
Favorites are interesting because favorites you can't necessarily see. Like if you go onto Twitter, you can see what people have favorited. This is, uh, it's all hidden. So you can basically send a little, you know, plus one, hi, hello, whatever, I, I like whatever it is you're doing. Or you can boost it. And the idea with boosting is that you set, you're basically making a public acknowledgement. I really like what, <laughs> I really like whatever it is that you're doing. Okay? So in terms of like a boost, uh, is it forced honoring, and sorry if you tell me this, is it forced honoring your like security rules? So like if you only sent it to a certain number of people, if they boosted it? And yes. Okay. Yes. So if I went to this particular post, I can't boost this. Okay. And it'll say this post okay. cannot be boosted. And if it's to your followers only, it won't allow you to boost that. So there are protections in place so that you can't, you know, accidentally or otherwise boost something. Okay. <coughs> All right. So you said the, the favorite's private to the person that clicked private, or is it private? It's private to the though? person that, that clicks it. So if you if you if you hit favorite, like if you hit a favorite on my thing, I'll get a notification about that, and then. Uh, <laughs> It, so I just got favorited, and I got notified that somebody favorited it. So that's my notification here. I sh and you can turn those notifications <laughs> off. It's just that this particular system, I didn't. Um, on my regular one, I've got all that crap turned off. Basically, I get like email notifications if someone replies to something. But otherwise, I don't, I don't want to know. <laughs> uh, you said you get email notifications? You can get email notifications. <laughs> and the... The administrator server sends you that email? Yes. Yes. So, and so one of the recent things, again, we can do the whole reading on, on Twitter grievances. Uh, one of the things that Twitter most recently did is they will not send you an email message for each message that you do. Uh, they'll try and uh, do a little digest thing, you know, like, here's what you missed. We'll tell you this whenever we feel like it. With this, it will do it for every particular one. But there's also the ability, if you, if you, you know, cherish your inbox and you happen to get a lot of follower requests or some other thing like that, you can also tell it to digest it for you if you, if you wish. Right. So is that an administrator setting or is that a um, That's a, that's a per person setting? setting. So I can go in here in my preferences and I can tell it. It's going to take a little bit for it to do that. So under notifications, can the administrator also make those changes since it's a per? per I don't server? know. I don't. I, I unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about setting up an instance or anything like that. That gets way into the weeds meeting? of <laughs> Docker and Ruby mm -hmm. and all sort of loveliness of Redis and Postgres and whatnot. And in order to do an introduction on all this stuff, I, that's one of the things that I cut out. <laughs> so yeah, you can tell it to send digest emails if you want. Um, you can also tell it to not email me or any of these other things. You can block notifications. You have a lot of flexibility in here for what you're sending out. Let's talk about following accounts because you're, you're going to want to do that because a social media or, you know, basically like a telephone. A telephone is useless if you have no one to call or no one to pick up on the other end. So you need to follow accounts. If you go to a site, now let me go here to... Incognito mode. So, Octodon slash at Craig. What you will see on my profile uh, as soon as I make it bigger is you'll see in the top corner this remote follow here. What that will allow you to do when you click on it, I'm going to bring up the slides again. When you click on this remote follow, it will bring up a box. And of course, that's really tiny, isn't it? I apologize for that. Uh, bring this up here. So if I click on remote follow, it'll allow you to enter your username and domain name in here. So if I were to type in <coughs> tip.cafe, what that does is it says, 
it, it, it sets up a connection between these particular systems and says, this particular user at this system would like to follow that user, primarily at octodon.social. I'd like to follow that particular user. So if I hit proceed to follow, you'll note <clears throat> that it starts off with octodon.social up here. You click proceed to follow. It then establishes a connection with toot.cafe and says, well, it, in, in reality, what will show up, and not fake reality here, I didn't put it up there. Nice. Good move, Craig. It will show a button that says authorize. So it'll say, do you want to actually follow this or not? And depending on the follower settings, it'll either say, you've automatically followed this particular person. If you're blocked, you won't be able to follow that particular person. Or if they've set it up where they have to approve your follow request, if they set it up for followers, you know, to approve all the follow requests, it'll say, your request is pending. So that's one way to follow, and that works pretty much anywhere. The other thing that works is if you go to the interface itself, so let me go back here, and let's say I want to follow I want to follow the, uh, the person who created Mastodon. So let me say Do a search here, uh, and he's not going to show up there. Use this account here. Um, oh goodness! Yeah, Mastodon. That's so true. Poof! There he is. You'll see right over here. You have this button that allows me to click on that. So if I click on that, boom! Now I'm following Eugen. Okay and I'll be able to see all of his toots in my own timeline if he decides to toot during this demo. So that's another way to follow someone. If you know their account, you can type it into the search area here and then click on the follow button. Some instances are a little bit better um, about having all the users from the Federation populated in here. Um, generally speaking, if, they, if, they connect, if that system knows about that other system, that will all be populated. It sounds a little more complex than it is. There's a lot of little machinery and whatnot going on behind there, but the idea is that if, if it knows about this other system, if it's already connected with that other system, it will, chances are it will have the user list of that other system already available for you to search. If it doesn't know about that other system, if you're following someone for the first time, then it has to make all those connections for doing federation and whatnot, and that user list may not be there. So again, the way that I showed you initially, where you go to that particular profile, particular user's profile, click on remote follow, and then type in your address, that's, that's guaranteed to work. Whereas with the search in that, it may or may not work. Is that making sense? Okay. So I, I showed you a little bit about searching. There's two things that you can search on Mastodon, and that is, you can search on hashtags, and you can search on users. Why is it limited to hashtags? Why wouldn't you do full text searching? Well, there's a reason for that. And the reason is that generally, um, things that happen on Twitter, and this is stuff that unfortunately a lot of uh, the folks that are in this room would not experience. And that is that people will find terms online, you know, they'll search for their favorite pet term, find that online, and then pester the hell out of whomever it is that made that particular post, because that person is wrong on the internet. Mm. I had that okay, you've had that happen, exactly. <laughs> Where, you know, someone just comes completely out of the blue and starts just going off on you because you managed to use that particular term. So, with hashtags, that allows people to find whatever topic it is that you're talking about. But it doesn't allow people to go into your normal conversations if you don't have hashtags or whatnot in there. It doesn't allow them to go and start finding your particular uh, comments and whatnot. There are some systems that allow you to do full text searching. Um, they're not necessary. They generally get blocked by a lot of the administrators because, again, it's one of those features that they don't want people to go dogpiling on people just because they managed to make have an opinion about something. Um, so there's that. It's a little nebulous reason, just take my word for it, it's a very good reason, and there's good reasons for why it is not implemented. 
You can also search for users, and I showed you a little bit about how to search for users in there. Um, let's do another quick demo. Let me do a search here on Mug. Let's see if anyone posted anything about Mug. Hey. I'm scared. <laughs> there we go. So this is me talking about, I think I have this, uh, my talk ready to go. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. And it will be streamed. Cool. All right. So I can do a search on that particular hashtag, and there's other hashtags as well. Um, mugging, apparently. Someone tweeted about that. And again, I can do a search on, on users um, as well. So let me just find someone. All right, there's someone else that I know that I could follow if I wanted to. Okay? Hopefully they'll show back up to Mug sometime. Preferences. There's a lot of things in preferences. Um, I'll do a quick demo of what is inside preferences. Oh, that's wild. Um, on this area. So you can set your default language. There's a lot of folks um, in the world, funnily enough, that don't speak English as their first language. Um, who knew? Uh, so you can select what, what language you uh, primarily speak in. And there are also folks who don't necessarily want to see every single language out there. Uh, if you go into the Federated Timeline around midnight-ish, 11 o'clock, you'll find a lot of Japanese folks have woken up. And so there'll be a lot of Japanese text in the Federated Timeline. If you wanted to filter that out, you could uh, click over here and say, I want to filter out Japanese, or Chinese, or whatever. And I don't know why this says I don't want to filter out uh, German. But uh, apparently at one time I did. Uh, there's also, you can set your default post pri uh, privacy as well. So in here I've got it set so that everything that I set is, say is public. But if I wanted to set it up so that everything is followers only, I can do so as well. That's your call. So does that do it for posts going forward or all posts? For posts going before? forward. Okay. Yeah. Anything that's already out there, you can't retroactively change. But anything that you do going forward, you can't. You can also say mark my media as sensitive. Um, funnily enough, there are, uh, when Twitter banned a whole bunch of sex workers out there, uh, they created their own Macedon instance called Twitter. So they, ideally, um, most of the stuff that they're going to post, I wouldn't say it's necessarily not safe for work, it's just not safe for most workplaces uh, that are out there. So uh, you can set that up to mark it all as sensitive. You can also set it up so that you want to opt out of public search engine indexing. So if Google comes knocking, uh, your posts don't necessarily get to show up in there. It'll try and avoid that. There's different site themes as well. This one's using the Tote Cafe uh, theme. But there's also, and this is <laughs> amazingly ugly, uh, and I'll demonstrate that a little bit later. Uh, and again, uh, show confirmation dialogues. Uh, Mastodon does not autoplay uh, GIF files, GIF files, whatever you wish to call those. It doesn't autoplay those, so you don't have to see animation go flipping by. But if you do, you can. It's it's your call. You have that freedom to do so. You can also have it so that um, it automatically shows media. Take your chances. Uh, <laughs> it'll always show that. You can have it reduce motion in animations, uh, and again, use the system default font in there. I am not going to hit that save changes quite yet. Mm. <laughs> hey, I have to have something to keep you guys interested. Mm -hmm. you know, a little teaser. Disappointed there wasn't a Windows Me thing. <laughs> <laughs> we talked a little bit about notifications. Uh, security. So if you are security conscious, uh, you can change your password, <laughs> which is good. You can also see which applications have access to your account, um, and you can delete your account if you wish. Uh, you can set up two-factor authentication. Uh, this one is uh, set up a little differently, but if you wish to set up two-factor authentication, so you get you know notified uh, whenever someone's signing in, you can then put in your code and whatnot. You can import and export your data, and this is key. So let's say you choose an instance. 
and you want to later on say, you know, I want to move to a different instance, but I want to keep all my followers. I want to keep all of the folks that I've blocked, all the people that I've muted. You can import that here. Uh, and conversely, you can also export that here. So if you want to uh, save all your followers. Let's say you decide, you know, I just want to keep my followers list as a backup, uh, just in case something happens. Uh, you can say, okay, I want a CSV file of this, and boom, there you go. Which is also kind of neat if you're uh, maintaining multiple accounts and you want to keep the followers list between all those accounts, you can do so if you want. Yes? Yeah, that's actually what I was just going to ask. Yeah. Like, how do you kind of coordinate, like if you wanted to, like realistically, if you're one, in one instance, how do you see, like is there a good way to kind of automate that? I don't know if there's an automated way. I mean, you could probably script it okay. um, if you want. There's also an API okay. available, which I'm not going to go too much into the API, but yeah. the API is the people who are, are working on the API stuff are really good about this stuff. And um, especially, so they, they used the Twitter API initially, and they kind of enhanced it a bit. So yeah, you can do data export in that. It's basically all the stuff that Twitter started pulling out over time. Yeah, you can do that. And authorized applications. So these are the applications that have the ability to take a look at this and authorized followers. And what's neat about this is it will tell you, these are all the followers on these other instances that are following you. So if you're okay with that, that's cool. You don't have to do anything. But if you suddenly notice, hey, there's this instance that is following me that I'm not aware of, or that I've heard is doing rogue things, like say, saving people's tweets or toots, and then indexing and doing nefarious things with it, you can see what's going on with that. And then you can say, okay, I want to lock down my account and make sure that all the people that are following me, I know who's following me. It may not, it may be just, you know, a little bit more make work for me to say, authenticate these people, authorize these people. But that's, again, that gives you the freedom to figure out how you want to be on your social media, which is really cool. So when you delete something on your own instance, and one of the uh, the other sites yeah, displays it in the feed. Mm -hmm. When you delete that post, there's no there's there's no way to recover. You know, make sure that it's deleted everyone. Uh, in as much as it, it basically it's it's a it has to, it's the honor system. All the instances are supposed to honor a delete request. It's up to that instance to say whether it doesn't. Um, and so you could, you're in another instance could theoretically say, oh, they deleted that, might, that might be important, and do something else with it. So again, it's trusting the, the whole network. Most of them, if you delete it off there, it'll just disappear from the timeline altogether. And I mean, in literal real time, it will disappear off the timeline, which is really weird, because you'll look at something, you'll go scrolling, and all of a sudden, poof, that goes, it goes away. Um, but yeah, it's, there's no, there's, there's protections in that you have to trust the folks that are out there doing this stuff. And generally speaking, bad actors tend to be found out. Um, so people will, like um, in the case of one account or uh, app that was out there, um, they realized that that app, the reason that it was able to allow people to do full text searching on it was because they were collecting all of the data from that particular app. And generally speaking, the community will find bad actors like that and let people know and then the administrators have the option to block those those particular instances from doing that so again it's 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 a little wild west but it's also a lot of people who are working toward a common good yes so I'm trying to understand how this distributed thing works so everybody has their own copy and somehow you get a link and then when you link you can share information back to I'll, I'll talk about that when I get to activity pub and how that works um, but that's the protocol that's underneath of that. Yeah, so more interested in, is it just one instance that you have, that your data is on that one instance? Correct, yeah. So you're not like having distributed the sense that if one system goes down, the other system still has the data. It still has the, the copy of it in as much as that it has to have whatever data that was given to it so that it can display the timeline. So it will still have that data in there. Um, but the idea is that that data, if you if you send out a delete request, the other system is on its honor supposed to delete that particular information. 
Same, yes. for, same for all the multimedia for stuff, like video files and pictures. That, that saves that as well. Okay. So, yeah. like if I upload a 10 hour video. If you upload a 10 hour video, there's a better instant, there's a better way to do that, and I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So there's uh, another system for reporting, muting, and blocking folks. Um, again, bad actors tend to be found out rather quickly. Uh, so if I go over here and, you know, that James guy is a real pain in the butt. You know, <laughs> he's sending me tweets and toots and whatnot. Uh, I'm going to report him. So I can do the following. So you can report me as well as block me? I can report you. So if I go over here and I click on report, that will bring up a form. I'm not going to actually do that, but it will bring it before him. So I can say, hey, this guy's, yeah, I can give it a reason for it, and I can also then click on certain toots that he's put on there to say, you know, hey, take, administrator, take a look at these. You, you've got someone who's acting ill uh, for the community. I can also block him. And what blocking does is it prevents him from following me uh, and prevents him, and when he's logged in on this particular account, from looking at anything on my profile. It doesn't mean that if he decides to go somewhere else that he won't show up somewhere. Um, and you, know, you can play a little bit of whack-a-mole with people <laughs> out there for this stuff. But again, it's, it's the, what we have at the moment. Mute, what that does is it allows me to, you know, let's say that James decides to go over to, um, or decides to live to WWDC. And I don't necessarily care about Apple products uh, right now. So I can temporarily mute him if I want so that none of his stuff shows up in my timeline. Um, I can also, and I, I didn't mention this, but under these here, I can set it up so that I can filter out boosts. I can also filter out replies. And I also have the ability to filter out anything via regex. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to put WWDC, I would no longer see anything from WWDC. And you can set up these long mm -hmm. regex monstrosities to filter out all this stuff. Are those just space separated or? It's, it's actual regex, so you'd oh, have okay. to put in an actual regex um, field in there. So, so not quite as user friendly as, as one might hope. How would you do ORs and ANDs? As you would in a regex. <laughs> just double. Yeah. Double pipe or double ampersand? Yeah. Are they saving PCRE? Uh, it's whatever Ruby handles, I think. So. <laughs> Possibly, I'm not sure. We don't know. Whatever yeah. Ruby has. Yeah. I think I think it's how Ruby does yeah. it. That would that would be my assumption. So that's how you mute the report or blocks, and again, for your own sanity, and for the community's sanity. <laughs> the instance also can silence or block folks as well. Uh, so if I go over to Octodon here and head on over to about this instance, which is, where is it? Oh, right here. Right in front of my face. So if I go over here, this is uh, the administrator. Uh, it's a lovely squirrel. Which is Lily Squirrel, um, and it talks about the policies of the site. Um, one of those being advertising, federation, and politics, content warning, uh, enforcement. I'll make it just a little bit bigger here. Set this. Uh, it also talks about how you can support her and uh, silenced instances. And it's a list of, that's just uh, to let everyone know these are the instances that are silenced. What is silence versus blocking? Silenced means that everyone on that other instance is set to followers only. So none of their stuff will show up in the public timeline <laughs> for, that for that instance. So you can still follow those folks if you want. If you want to follow any of those folks, you are more than welcome to do so. It's just none of their stuff will show up in the federated timeline. Again, it's because the administrator, for whatever reason, said you're doing something that I don't necessarily feel is good for the entire community. So. I'm going to remove you from the federated instance on this particular instance. Blocking is a little stronger than that. Blocking says, I am no longer federating with you at all. You are no longer federating with me. So it's a, it's a little stronger, 
Um, that's usually reserved for people who are, you know, again, archiving toots without necessarily doing, you know, doing proper stuff with it, um, acting in bad faith, those type of things um, that allows you to block that. Okay, <laughs> naturally. So I talked about silencing, I talked about blocking. And you can learn more about this over at the URL. I mentioned it in the video, uh, joinmastodon.org. What that has is it has a list of all the instances. It has an instance picker, so you can put in various things that you may be interested in. Um, they have different topics. Uh, whether you care about adult content on there or not, some people don't necessarily want to see adult content. Some people don't necessarily care. Um, it allows you to show what your preferences are and allows you to do topic searches as well. It's like I am interested in, again, role-playing games. You know, it'll allow you to find those particular instances because there are a lot of instances that are out there. With, with the instances themselves, so you said like, I mean, is it as soon as you become a, a mass on instance, you're listed on the site? Or there, do you know if there's controls? Uh, there are some controls. There, there are some instances that choose not to be on their, that list. Again, it's up to the administrator, and there's a, there's a whole template of things that they put on there, like these are the topics that we are involved with, and um, who's, the, who's the administrator of that instance and that. So, so there's some uh, clients. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Twitter, but Twitter seems to not like third-party clients anymore. Uh, they want to charge them exorbitant amounts of money in order to get pretty basic features. Um, Macedon doesn't do that. Mastodon, again, has kind of a Twitter um, API with it. Uh, one that I use for Android, uh, which I can recommend, is Tusky. Uh, it's open source. So you can head on over to the Google Play Store or download the F-Droid or um, Amazon App Store stuff and get that onto your phone if you so desire. There are ones for Apple um, and a whole bunch of other systems. I didn't necessarily highlight them because I don't necessarily know anything about them. Uh, one that tends to be popular is Amarok, um, with a Q at the very end of it. But if you go to Join Mastodon, you can find more information about various clients. One that I can also recommend is one called Tootstream. Tootstream is a command line client that was developed by Sarah Murray and is maintained by some guy named Craig Maloney. I can do a quick demo of that. Trust that guy? I, you know, I trust that guy like I trust myself. <laughs> so here is Tootstream. Now it has help, uh, so you can get information about stuff, and you can do a good number of things on here. Uh, you can take a look at the home timeline, and it will show uh, media as well. So you were mentioning about whether uh, systems save media locally or not. It saves that media onto that system. So if I clicked on this, it would be as if it would show up on the Octodon instance. Um, you can do notifications as well. You can see all the people that said lovely things about, uh, about stuff. You can also stream. So if I wanted to stream stuff, um, it will say initializing stream, and then any time a notification or a uh, toot comes in, it will then pop up onto that screen. And I can in real time say, you know, favorite, boost, etc. You can learn more about it um, on the GitHub, and it's also available in the list of clients in that. And you can ask me about it if you wish, because, hey, why not? All right. How long have you been maintaining that? Uh, since around October-ish, I think. Um, maybe a little earlier than that. What's it written? It's written in Python. And it is fabulous. Uh, there's also front ends for Mastodon, and I'll demonstrate one of them. Uh, so, oh, I forgot too. I, I also cheated you out of seeing this in glorious Windows 95 vision. Let me do that now. You almost made it. Too. I almost did. <laughs> this is this is brutally awful. Oh, God. Wow. That's amazing. Twenty years ago. Uh, 
So yeah, if if you want to relive the heady glory days of oh god, I can't even watch this. <laughs> I can't even look at that. It's it is hard to watch. Hideous. I would like it even more wow. if it somehow inherited it like a natural lag to it. Was like, <laughs> <laughs> just extra loading screen for you? Like, <laughs> so this is Pinafore. <laughs> So Pinafore is a front end that you can attach to your Mastodon uh, account. And it's, it's, so if you don't like the, the way that the front end looks on Mastodon, but you don't necessarily want to throw another, um, throw an application on your system, you can use Pinafore. There's also uh, Brutaldon, which is brutalistic. Um, and then Halcyon which is also another really interesting interface. So you can check those out. Um, it's really cool that they allow you to do it. And it, it basically says, um, I'm an app. Do you want to authorize me, yes or no? Type in your instance, and then it acts basically as your front end for it. Hmm. So Mastodon is only part of this story. Uh, and I mentioned ActivityPub a lot. Um, ActivityPub is really the glue for a lot of the federated web, um, which is really, taking off ever since uh, ever since ActivityPub was made a W3C recommendation. Uh, it became a recommendation pretty much this year, uh, back in March, uh, and then suddenly the, flo the floodgates opened and mm -hmm. people started writing a whole bunch of different clients in ActivityPub. Uh, it was co-edited by Jessica Talon and Christopher Lemmer Weber. Uh, Christopher Lemmer Weber is one of those folks that uh, got me interested in schemes, so you can blame him for that. He's one of those folks that uh, I, his, his mind is just, I want to, to just, you know, shake it out and see what comes out of it. Because it's just a lot of wonderful stuff. Uh, it was based on Pump.io, hey, remember that? Uh, and the work of Evan Padromo um, for Identica, um, what it became after it was, uh, it stopped being status net. So we can learn more about ActivityPub at activitypub.rocks. And one thing that I would like to, actually, I think it was the other link that I wanted, uh, is this overview. And the reason that I want to look at the overview here is because they have a really good tutorial about how ActivityPub works. So if you have an actor, and the actor in this case is a person, but an actor can also be a thing or um, a bot, or any of these things like that. Basically, it's something that has an inbox and an outbox. And it uses JSON. And the uh, it has an ID, and that ID is where that gets sent off to. Or, I'm sorry, it has the inbox link here and the outbox link. So that is where those particular messages come from and where they go to. OK? And so let's say um, I want to post something to my outbox. The rest of the world then gets that from my outbox. And the rest of the world can then post things into my inbox and then I receive it. So this is the fundamentals of how all of these applications work together. Um, and so it's, it, there's a vocabulary. I'm not going to get too, too in-depth into the vocabulary. There's a large vocabulary of things. Most of it's social media based, so a lot of it's like like, follow, block, delete, all that kind of stuff that you would do in a social media context are available there. But you can also extend it if you want. Um, and I know one of the other projects um, in the area is using that um, as kind of a logging system. So anytime that someone does something, it does an activity pub logging message to another actor out there. And so that then gets it, it does it via pub sub type stuff. So it's really cool stuff. I definitely hope you check it out, um, especially because then you'll be able to integrate with Mastodon and a whole bunch of other stuff. So um, the other stuff, there's a, just a, a brief list of other stuff in here. Uh, I'm going to mention a few of them. Uh, one of them is Plurima, uh, which is an Elixir-based social media network. Uh, what's really, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Rustodon, which is a Rust-based Mastodon, um, which at least it will be. Smilodon, um, I think that's a little more of one, but it's a Python-based Mastodon uh, instance as well. Peer2, which I'll talk about in just a second. PixelFed, which is image sharing. Um, it doesn't do federation quite yet, but that's on the cards for it. Hubzilla, uh, some of you may know of Hubzilla. 
Um, Hubzilla um, also, I think, is supporting it or will be supporting uh, Activity Pub very shortly. Uh, get Together, uh, which is a meetup type group. Um, they're talking about federating that stuff. So if you wanted to, say, create a meeting, uh, you could then broadcast it to all the people who are following your group by just clicking, you know, I create a meeting, and then boom, it goes out to the rest of the folks. And then Media Goblin, which was the whole reason that Christopher Lemmer Weber got involved with Activity Pub in the first place, because Met, uh, Media Goblin was supposed to be a social network type media sharing system. And the protocols that were available weren't necessarily good. So what do you do? Hey, let's get involved with the working group for it. There's not going to be much time involved with doing that. It's just going to be one hour a week. Yeah. <laughs> he, can, he can tell you a little bit more about how that worked. So plur, Pluroma, uh, again, is one of those uh, Mastodon, or not Mastodon, but Activity Pub based social networks. Uh, it is based off of the Activity Pub protocol directly, so anything that Activity Pub does, uh, it does as well and can be extended. So if Activity Pub gets some form of extension to it, uh, they'll incorporate that directly. Whereas opposed to Mastodon, has a translation layer that they bake on top of it. And the neat thing about that is it's low resource, so if you wanted to run it off of a Raspberry Pi, you could do so. Um, whereas Mastodon it gets into the whole Docker containers, Ruby, large application stuff. So if you want to learn more, uh, if you go to pleroma.social, you can learn more about that. PeerTube. You may ask, what is PeerTube? What is PeerTube? <laughs> PeerTube is an open source video platform. Like YouTube or Vimeo, you can watch, comment, and upload videos online, but there's more. It empowers you to be more than a user. You can make the web yours by installing your own PeerTube federation. PeerTube instances can sync together. When MeowTube chooses to sync with DocTube, all of DocTube videos can be watched on MeowTube. The video files stays on DocTube server while being streamed seamlessly to MeowTube. This federation approach creates a video network with shared video catalog without paying for more disk space. This is the base of the web. Peer-to-peer -peer streaming. You don't need a data center to run PeerTube. When someone watches a video, it is streamed directly from the PeerTube instance. When several people watch simultaneously the same video, bits of the video are shared between them in the background. Peer-to-peer -peer streaming makes video streaming resilient and efficient. A successful video shouldn't bring an instance down. User freedom. PeerTube is an open source software with community-driven development. Institutions, media, communities, anyone can make their own video tube with our own rules at a low cost. In the long run, you'll be able to find and join the PeerTube instance that really suits you. Make the web yours again, get its control back one video at a time, just join PeerTube. Join PeerTube.org. You'll notice a the theme with a lot of these things. Join whatever it is, .org, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Let me go through here real quick. So yeah, PeerTube is really cool um, because, again, you have all these different instances that are hosting their own videos, but what's interesting about this is it's ActivityPub based. So in this very tiny video here, what you'll see is this particular user is finding a PeerTube instance and then following it on Mastodon. And then, when they go to their PeerTube instance, they can upload a video, and in this case, it is the Sintel trailer, because Creative Commons by attribution licensed. So they can show that it's been recently added over here. And if they go back to Mastodon, they can see that it has been added, and you can watch the video directly from Mastodon. It's been sent over via ActivityPub to your Mastodon instance. You're now watching it on Mastodon. Hmm. Okay? So does that get... And now, if you reply to it and say whatever it is that you're saying in very tiny print, <laughs> if you go back over to PeerTube, and it becomes part of the conversation, if you go back to PeerTube, you can see that someone has commented on there. So both of those systems are now integrated. So... You can publish on PeerTube, 
goes out to your social network of all the people that are following you, and then they can, again, respond to that particular instance. And then you, if they respond on there, it then sends a notification back to you that says that they responded. So it integrates all this stuff in a unique way. And that's the really beauty thing about uh, Activity Pub. Yes? So Mastodon will interact with all these instances? Mastodon will interact currently with, uh, with Peertube, uh, with Pleroma. Um, it'll also interact with uh, GNU Social as well. So you have all these different communities being able to connect with each other in unique and interesting ways. And again, there's more applications that are coming out that will allow people to interact and connect with all these different applications via ActivityPod. Yes? So if you have a video on Peertube, Yes. Does it get cached on your Mastodon server, or is it more of like a reference or? A link I think it's more of a reference. I'm not entirely sure of what's underneath it. I don't think it's actually downloading the entire video. That would be bad, I think. But, but that's that's the idea of it. Is I think it's a marker, and then it goes to the PeerTube instance, and then gets the video data from that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that is a lot to cover. Mm -hmm. But again, it's exciting times. Uh, again, Activity Pub was just re made a recommendation, so developers are starting to under uh, know about it, starting to get used to it, starting to understand it, and more unique things are coming out of it. So one more thing about Twitter, and I alluded to this a little bit earlier. Again, Twitter is, is going through and taking away bits of functionality from their developers. They are taking away uh, the ability to do uh, push notifications, and they're taking the away the ability to do timelines automatically, unless you pay them large amounts of money. And we're talking like 250 users with some ridiculous amount. So if you have the users of something like, um, if you have a large number of users using your application, that add adds, adds up to some serious money. Twitter does not want you using apps on their system. They want you to use the website. They want you to use their app. They want to be able to serve ads directly to you. And Mastodon is not about that. Mastodon does not worry about ads. So you can connect to Mastodon with whatever you've got. You know, someone at Twitter is probably saying that right now. And things are just going to get worse over time as Twitter tries to make sure that they meet their, their quotas and their bottom line. So, the choice is up to you. Hmm. Any other questions? Yes? So, I'm super stubborn, and I don't want to uh, join a social network for reasons. Okay. Um, but I follow, say, a technology, broad, uh, technology podcast, mm -hmm. and the host occasionally says, hey, check out my social media network that has this photo, this picture, or this video link, or whatever. Mm -hmm. What's it like, what's it look like from the outside looking in? From the outside looking in, so let's say I go to here, and I go to social, from the outside, oh, come on, Google, don't be that way. I think you click on the first link, right? Uh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> Well, sometimes that's like the one first of the first ad, that's so. one of, Well, you know, there are other Craig Maloney's that have knocked me off the first page of Google. <laughs> Damn you all. Um, I call them my forks. Anyways, uh, so here's a little bit of profile information. And down here is my pinned toots. And then anything that I've put out that is public is available on there. If it's followers only, if it's unlisted, it's not going to show up in this listing here. So anything that's public will be out there. It just stays in chron order. It stays in chronological order unless I pin it. So there's a way to pin a toot to your profile. To the top. To the top. And you can have multiple pinned toots. Are the pins in chronological order or? They're pinned last in, first up. So last yeah. pin is the first Reverse one that's out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to like unpin, repin? Yes. To change your order? Yes. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Back to the questions. Underlying this mm -hmm. federation is a network of the federated instances, uh, a full mesh where every node connects to every other node, 
or is there a uh, <clears throat> some sort of uh, a uh, network? Like a hub or something like that. Or I think it's I think it's more mesh network. Um, so every instance is is sending that out to every other instance. So if I post something, and I have followers on all those different machines, my understanding is that each one of those machines will then be pinged by my particular instance. Um, that's my understanding. I'm not sure if there's anything underlying in between, so it just goes to one particular thing, and then that takes care of all that stuff. I think it's, the idea is that it's, it goes to another sub-process on that machine, and then that goes through and pings all the rest of them. Is there a typical delay caused by the work in the ping? Not, the I've not the noticed thing? it. Um, I, I've not also gotten to the point where I have a whole bunch of followers and whatnot. I mean, I, in my instance, I have a whole bunch of people that follow me because I'm the, I'm, if basically if you log on to Octanon.social, I'm one of the three people that you get automatically followed. Um, but it only stays on that particular system. I've not been in the in the I've not had a whole bunch of external followers mm -hmm. and I've not noticed it on any of the other machines that I've been on when I post something like that. Yes? So two <laughs> questions. You said you know something about large uh, installation uh, yes. size. Do you have any idea how big you have to have how much hardware you need to out of this? You need to have something that would support a Docker container. Um, so that generally puts out things like Raspberry Pis, because Raspberry Pis and Docker don't necessarily go well together. Um, as far as that, I think you need to have stuff like Redis, you need to have Postgres. Um, I th I'm not sure what else is there. There's inst installation instructions that are available, um, but it, it, it's, in the, it's in the realm of you need to at least have something that can handle Postgres in a large scale and something that can handle Docker in a large scale. Those, those are your big things. Yes? Second question, I'm looking at the, the Wikipedia and, and it's talking about the license and it says, you knew a Frio? The Faro? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I don't, I've never heard of that, what is that? That is a variant of GNU licensing for web-based applications. So under your traditional GNU application license, <laughs> like V2, um, and I think even V3 without a Faro, but don't hold me to that. Um, what happens is if you make changes to the source code, you don't have to publish those changes to the outside world. You can, you don't have to distribute those changes. So if you don't, if you put up your website and make changes to the code, you are not under any obligation to post those changes anywhere. Under a Faro, if you post that you are then obligated to distribute your changes to the rest of the community. So it's a little more explicit about the sharing aspect of the GNU license. Which, you know, for some folks that's cool, for some folks that's, that's pretty much a deal breaker. Yes? So Twitter, when it began, was pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, from what I understand, it has problems with civility. Is there any reason to believe, other than the search feature you mentioned before, yeah. that is this grew larger, uh, hoping that it does, yeah. that people <laughs> would find uh, that would discourage the problems with civility? Here's a little bit of insider baseball in the community. <laughs> um, so some people are perfectly fine with how Macedon is right now. Some people don't think that it goes far enough as far as anti-abuse technology. Um, and some people are just like, I'm, I'm done with it because there's too many people in this particular culture, mostly in the, the white male programmer culture uh, for their tastes. So there is a, there are groups that are forming to try and come up with better technology for combating harassment and some of the other ills that are out there. What I find hopeful about stuff like Mastodon is that it is not, while Mastodon itself is controlled by one person, Eugene Roshko, it's, you can still fork it. There are people who maintain active forks of Mastodon. And being that it's in the G, on the Faro GPL license, those are then obligated to be shared with the rest of the community. Um, is it going to be perfect? Probably not. Um, is there, there are a lot of measures for people to try and make it better. Um, we'll have to see where it goes. I'm very hopeful that it will 
improve and that it will become a better Twitter. The other problem with uh, a Twitter-like experience, and this gets back to uh, something else that I mentioned, you know, the, the Lance Ulanoffs, the journalists, the people that are used to broadcasting in a media where they can amass a large audience are not going to be well served by a Mastodon. You cannot win Mastodon. So if you go on Twitter, you can take a look at all the followers that are out there and see this person has the largest number of followers. There's a whole number associated with it. And, and as wise people have said, anytime you put a number to anything, you create competition. You've created a game out of this. And so you cannot win this game because it is so distributed. You can be the largest follower number on that particular instance, but there could be someone on another instance that's got 10 times the followers that you have. So, it, for people who are trying to do broadcasting to a large number of people, it may not serve them very well. And it may even frustrate some of those efforts. Um, so, you may not see a lot of, of famous personalities going on there and really sticking with it. I've seen a, a lot of them where they will get on there and they'll stick around for a little bit and then it's like, okay, uh, I need to grow my audience. And so they'll grow their audience over it in Twitter. So that's that's some of the things that I've seen. Did I answer your question or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did you have another question about that? No. Okay. All right. Yes? What happens when an instance dies? Or uh, it, it has happened. Or uh, um, there, was a, there was a famous instance, uh, <laughs> witches.town. Uh, where the administrator just got fed up with the whole community uh, and said, I'm taking the instance down. What happens under the best of circumstances is that they let everyone know, and so they all back up their data and they find another instance to go to. Under the worst cases where an instance will get hacked or an instance will just you know, go down and, and the administrator is just either negligent or just unwilling to, to get it back up, um, hopefully you kept it back up. Otherwise, you just find another instance and, and go find your um, go find your your other instance. What has uh, been added recently is the ability to put in a forwarding address. So some people would change their profile picture to you know a, a grayed out profile, or put text in there that says I'm no longer at this particular instance. What people will do now is you can say I'm no longer at this particular instance and it will automatically put a link to your new instance in there. So you can leave a forwarding address. If you're no longer using an account, you can say, I'm, I'm going to be over at this particular account. And it's up to those folks if they want to follow you over there. So is it, say something goes down, and I'm remotely following. Say I'm following, I've got a home instance somewhere else, yeah. but I'm following the latest tabletop game craze, and tabletop instance goes down. Yeah. Um, do all of the have do all the messages that I've received from that instance in my local timeline, are they just poof gone? Or those should stick around um, because those are those are cached locally in that particular instance's timeline. Mm -hmm. um, so what may happen is that if you are following people from that particular in, or if you are people are from that instance are following you, mm -hmm. eventually uh, Mastodon will, will give up trying to send those. They'll say, okay, I can't send these particular things, and they'll just delete those particular messages. So if that instance decides to come back up, there will probably be a gap for however long that instance was down and before Mastodon gave up. Um, that gap will, will not be in their timeline. Um, I'm not sure how many member measures there are for it to catch up, whether it goes there. And, but I, my understanding of it is that if it's down and Mastodon gives up trying to send to it, if it suddenly comes back up, anything from that point forward from when it comes back up will get sent out. That's my understanding. Uh, yes? I was just kind of curious, so it, and if you don't have the answer, it's, it's cool. I was just wondering, like, from the side of, because of the different instances, if you are sending to an instance, and all of a sudden your instance, for whatever reason, the same way that it was emailed, gets blocked, mm -hmm. does Mastodon notify you that you are no longer able from your instance to send to this instance? Like, if you have followers on another instance? Yeah, um, if, you're, if you're notifying someone, I don't necessarily know how, how, I mean, I could find out because I know people have blocked me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but as far as like putting, you know, putting an at sign in front of it or whatever it does, like with Twitter, um, I think you can still put the person's name in there, but it won't show as highlighted or something like that. 
I'm not sure if there's a visible cue for that on this. Yeah, I was wondering more from like the followers list. You're not like direct messaging someone, but you're sending something to followers, mm -hmm. right? Like you're posting to followers or you know, tooting the, yeah. the followers. Would there be some sort of notification of? I don't believe so. Okay. I think the only notification you would get is if you visited that person's profile and they came back and said that you were blocked. Okay. Uh, that's my understanding. Yes. So do people spin up instances for, let's say, for a specific period of time for certain topics and then, you know, just have them disappear after a certain amount of time? Is that people do I, I'm not aware of them, but I don't see why you couldn't do that. Like spin it up for a conference or something? Or yeah. election, you know, up until the election happens. Yeah. And then, uh, so how much, resource, how, many, how, many, how much resources are required to spin up an instance? Again, that, that gets back to Gibbs' question, and I don't know the answer offhand. But again, it's it's you need to have the ability to run Docker, or uh, or something along those lines. Um, it's pretty beefy. I mean, it's a Ruby application. It's a large Ruby application, and there's a lot of moving parts underneath it for what it's doing. Um, so, again, you'd have to you'd have to find out. And there's administrators that that could help you out with that. Um, Especially the one with um, Octodon.social, she does she does uh, maintenance for Mastodon.social as well. So you may be able to ping her and see um, how much space you would need for something. And again, it depends. If you've got something and you only get a few messages here and there, you're probably not going to need a whole lot. But if you're running like one of the major popular instances out there, you may need to start scale it up a bit. Like if you're running Mastodon.social, you you really have to scale it up. And a lot of those, I think, are run out of Scaleway in France. Um, so they use ARM-based processors and whatnot um, for it. But that's that's one option. Um, they, there was a Mastodon as a service, um, M-A-A-S, not confusingly related to Metal as a service. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the person who ran it, again, the person who was doing Octodon, Basically, didn't have the mental bandwidth anymore to really run it because it was became a, it became a full time job without the full time paycheck along with it, and so that I think they, they spun that down. Um, there probably is an opportunity for someone to do that though, if someone wanted to do Mastodon as a service type thing, um, they would be more than willing to uh, probably let you either have it, <laughs> like here you go, <laughs> run away. Um, but yeah, there, there are definitely some community opportunities uh, for that type of thing. And again, there's a lot of people who are interested in this stuff. You know, want to spin up their instances, take a look and see you know, what's going on behind the covers and whatnot. Um, so that may be something that may be interesting. Um, and there's, again, people in the community that have better answers to that than I do. Yeah, it seems like the most resource intensive thing from up with Google is the Redis instance itself. Yeah. It's up the most in all the space for the message team. There, yeah, Reddit, I, it, it, I'm not going to say it abuses it, but it definitely uses a whole lot of it. Yeah, it, just from a quick like search for someone doing a Kubernetes cluster, it seems like that's the only one that's really resource intensive. Yeah. Just off of the follow up. All right, I think that's all the time we have, so. Where did you get your shirt? Uh, I got this, uh, Designed by Humans <laughs> uh, is the name of the company that makes it, and um, there, Eugene has a link, I think, it pinned on his port as a, uh, uh, let me see if I can find it. Oh, that's acting weird. That's acting weird. Let me see if I can bring this up here. May I have your attention, please? The time is now 8.30 and the library will be closing in 30 minutes at 9 o'clock. Please be advised that the library's internet connections will shut down approximately So there's a link to it here, uh, designedbyhumans.com. I think if you just go do that and do a search for Mastodon, you can find stickers, like <coughs> said sticker here, nice. and uh, in this shirt. And cool. the shirt's about 25 bucks. Cool. I didn't say that out loud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes? Uh, can I get that theme in hot dog stand? I, if you want to create your own instance, by all means, go for it. I don't know if that exists in the wild. You can probably even create your own front end for it. It's, it's, it's your call and, and your eyeballs. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
it over to Craig. And it'll turn it over to me. Uh, please fill out your comment cards. They're very important. And by the way, that's my email address. And if you want to follow me on octodon.social, let's talk. And your website. And my website, decafbad.net, which also has links to other stuff. All right. Click to exit the presentation. Clicked.